You started, Kimberly? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, Elijah had lived down by the brook Cherith. The water ran out. Then he went by the widow and her son. And they never had their bread run out. And they also, the son was raised from the dead by Elijah. Well, the total time here now that we get to this story is three and a half years. So you can imagine, again, most of the people in Israel were some type of farmer. They raised their own crops. They raised their own materials. And for three and a half years, they had no rain. Every year, they'd probably go out and plant some seed, and no rain would come. So by now, the people are hungry. You can imagine being starving out of food. And uh, Ahab is, well, it was his stubbornness that got them into this predicament, but he also knows he needs Elijah to speak to the Lord for him because it's the Lord who controls rain. Would he ever admit that outwardly? You know, and say he's sorry and confess his sin? No, he wouldn't do that. Okay. So what did he do? He searched for Elijah everywhere. He, he probably figured he could force Elijah. I know, I'll bring him in and I'll, I'll whip him if he doesn't tell God or I'll put him in prison. I'll do something to him so that he will pray to the Lord to make the rain to come. Okay. So Ahab there, he, he was worried. Uh, we, we think about, he, he was worried about his nation. That's what he cares about, that his nation is strong and obviously without food that's not the case. But this famine not only affected Ahab and the people of Israel, it affected God's people there in Israel too. Okay? It wasn't just affecting, like when we look back at Egypt, and there it affected you know, the Israelite, or the Egyptians, but it didn't affect the people, some of the plagues in the land of Goshen. Here, these, this plague affects everybody. Okay? So, God comes and speaks to Elijah and tells Elijah to go to Ahab and tell him that rain will come. Now, he doesn't tell him a bunch of other things that are going to happen between now and then. But go to Ahab. Now Ahab, he was away. Okay, he was caring for his animals. His animals had to go far and wide to find green pastures. And of course the king, he could, well, what could he do if he needed pasture land for his animals? What do you think he could do, Grant? He can go wherever he wants. I am the king. And these are the king's animals. They are the most important to make sure my people and my soldiers are fed. So he could go. So they went far and wide to find those types of pastures. And of course, they're gone. And they can't find them. So Ahab has gone away when Elijah arrives at uh, the palace there in Samaria. So Elijah shows up there, knock, knock, knocks on the door, or however it was. And he's told that Ahab is gone. But what man does he meet? What man does he meet here? Jarrett? Obadiah. Yes, he meets a man named Obadiah. Now, Obadiah was an employee, some type of worker, in the home of Ahab. God placed him there so that he would be able to do some pretty marvelous and wonderful things. It was Obadiah could overhear what the king was saying. I'm guessing it's very similar to like when we read the Red Necklace where the royalty said, well, don't worry about those servants. They're like furniture. It doesn't matter what they hear or say or what they think. And that's probably very much how Ahab, so that Obadiah could hear exactly what, what the king was thinking and saying. Okay. So God brought Elijah there to meet Obadiah because Obadiah was a God-fearing man. God had placed in the home of Ahab. So Obadiah works in the home of Ahab, in the king's palace, and it's God's plan that he's there. Now, Obadiah is afraid for Elijah because Elijah is a prophet. And if we remember before now, Jezebel had gone out and killed many prophets. Okay. And Obadiah, because he knew what was coming, was able to go out, and we read here he was able to save a bunch of those prophets and hide them in a cave somewhere. And then because of his position also in the palace, even though people all around Israel were starving, so no one's going to be able to help these prophets out to get them any food, and they can't go out in the public, or Jezebel and her men will kill them. Again, God has provided a way for Obadiah. So Obadiah can go to the kitchens 
and maybe get some leftover scraps or some food that's not eaten. Say, say the king, sing Ahab and Jezebel, they sit down to a feast at the table and there's plentiful, you can see, great turkeys maybe set out there and some beautiful meats, vegetables and fruits that would make our mouths water. And of course, the king and queen and their people sit down to eat. And do they finish it? No, there's probably leftovers. And so Obadiah can grab those leftovers, and instead of them being tossed out or thrown to the animals, he can maybe take some of them to the prophets who are hiding away in that cave that he's protecting. Okay? So we, we, we see that God is working in Obadiah. Now, Elijah says, to Ob so Obadiah is afraid. Obadiah is afraid that what's going to happen to Elijah when Ahab and Jezebel get home? What's going to happen to Elijah? Micah, what do you think? Yeah, they kill the other ones. They're going to kill you, Elijah. Elijah tells Obadiah, don't worry. God is with me. God has protected me all these years, kept me hidden from Ahab, and now God has commanded me to come here. Therefore, he will protect me. So that's pretty. That's marvelous demonstration of faith that we can that we can see. And so the question here is that needs to be answered: is who is Jehovah? And the Bible says that who is the true one in control? Is it Baal, or is it Jehovah God? Who is in control? Who can make it rain? And that leads to a challenge. Okay. Ahab accuses Elijah in front of him here now, so Ahab has come back home. You can imagine when he gets the word that Elijah's here, he's frantic and gets himself whatever kingly priestly or kingly robes he needs to be dressed in and puts them on and goes in front of Elijah and they're having this discussion. And Ahab, of course, accuses Elijah of being in trouble. It's all your fault that these people are hungry and thirsty and dying. You're the one that prayed to God. Wow. Pretty strong accusation on the part of, of Ahab. And Elijah had the wisest answer he could say. Ahab, it's not me. It's you. Your refusal to bow down to God. Your refusal to put away your idols. Your refusal to lead the people of Israel in the godly worship is what has brought this upon you. Okay. So, what does is, what is Ahab and Elijah do? Well, they're going to have a contest. And so Elijah commands that all the people must come to what mountain? Jesse? Another name for it. Grant? Carmel. Come to Mount Carmel. And here we will see who the true God is. Come for a contest. Come to see. Come to witness. The power and majesty of the one true God. Let's see who it is. And so all the people come there. And Elijah demands and he says all 450 prophets must be there too. Don't just bring all the people. And we know that these prophets, they probably won't care. Say, Make sure they're there, Ahab. You must be there and bring your prophets with you too. They're going to be needed so that we can officially pull off this contest. Now, you might say, well, why didn't Ahab just throw Elijah in prison? Or why didn't Ahab just, you know, beat him, whip him? Ahab knew in his heart, just as all of us know in our hearts, we have to do God's will. And so Ahab, even though he wouldn't admit anything about God or outwardly, he knew he had to go along with this in order to get rain. That's his end goal. He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care who the true He just wants rain. He cares about himself. He's a selfish man. Okay? So... Uh, when they're all gathered there at Mount Carmel, Elijah spoke. We're going to find out here, ladies and gentlemen, who is the real God. Either God is the real God or Baal is the real God. Let's find out who it is. Choose with your hearts, though, before we start. Choose. In your heart, you know who the true God is. Uh, many of them were hard-hearted, so of course they're not going to change their, their minds. And uh, the people didn't even answer, the Bible says. They, they were quiet because in their hearts they knew what their their answer was. Alright, so now we need to get the plan ready for this contest. Two oxen are called for. And uh, each must be prepared for a sacrifice. So the oxen must be killed and prepared for the sacrifice. And one oxen will be given to the Baal prophets to use on their altar. 
and one oxen will be used by Elijah on his altar. Okay. And uh, now, what was the test? What was the true test about it? What, what was the test to see which was the real God? Katie? Well, All right. They were not allowed to light their own altar. You have to call down, pray to God, or your God, to call down fire from heaven and light that altar. Okay. So that's the challenge. That's the test. Whichever God answers with fire, well, that would be the true God. Okay. So who got to go first, Garrett? All right. So the purpose here, obviously, in Elijah's mind, is to teach that Jehovah is the only one true God. The men must of, of Israel must know that. They must see that there's only one true God. So the Baal prophets would call on Baal, Elijah. He would call on Jehovah. Whoever sent fire would be the one true God that all Israel should worship. The Baal prophets accepted the offer. They thought, no problem, we can call our God and he will make it happen. So the Baal prophets went first. They prayed from morning till noon, we read. They prayed all morning long. They were down on their knees, shouting. You can imagine them maybe marching around the altar or chanting or ripping their clothes and throwing ashes on their head. Who knows what foolishness they did to try to call on their God to bring down fire from heaven, chanting, murmuring. They began to be so frantic that they began to jump around and even jumped on the altar, screaming out and hollering at Baal, we can imagine. You can imagine the people down in Israel, a murmur going through the people, why isn't Baal doing this? Why isn't Baal sending fire? I thought he could do these things. We know that that's not the truth. And you can imagine in that huge crowd out there, little pockets of godly people thankfully praying that no fire came from heaven for that Baal prophet because they knew in their hearts who was the one true God. Elijah mocked them. What did he mock? How did he mock them? What did he What did he say to them? Kind of three different things. Well, maybe Baal is Micah. Yeah, well, maybe he's taking a nap. Shout a little louder, right? Grant? Yeah, maybe. Wow. Well, Baal prophet, maybe he's far, far away down the road. Maybe he's on a journey. He went on vacation. Wow. You're going to have to shout a little louder, Baal prophets. Make some more noise. And what was his third thing? Maybe he is faith. Yeah, he's out pursuing enemies. Maybe that's what he's doing. So, all kinds of things. Elijah's mocking them, making fun of them. Okay. We should mock others, but in this sense here, Elijah is mocking their foolishness and believing in another God. Said so We often mock others. We are fellow Christians because of differences that we may have, but that's not the case here. Well, the prophets, they couldn't stand it anymore. They couldn't believe fire wasn't coming from heaven. So what did they begin to do even more to themselves to try to get fire from heaven? What did they try to do, Courtney? Yeah, they began to cut themselves. They were probably saying, Baal, I'll offer myself. I will hurt and harm myself if you will just send fire. That's not the case. There is no God of Baal. It's a false god. There's no one there. They're praying to emptiness. They're praying to nothing. No fire ever came. Now it's Elijah's turn. He's given them almost the whole day. He doesn't need hardly any time at all. And so Elijah asks them to come near. Make sure you come close. Get close into my altar. See that I am doing no tricks. No magic, as we would use the term, is being done here. Okay? How many stones did he use to build his altar? How many stones? Emma? Hey, he uses 12 stones to build his altar, and that's a picture of Jesse what? The 12 tribes of Judah and Israel. Alright, the 12 sons of Jacob. Okay, each of the 12 tribes. And then he calls for what to be poured? So the bolt, an altar of stone, not of wood, but of stone is built here. And what is poured on top of that altar then? Micah. Four barrels of water. Yeah, 12 barrels of water are poured on top. 
These, the, the, this altar is saturated. It's drenching. You can't light anything on fire that's soaking wet. It wouldn't light. You gotta, if you cut down a tree, you've got to let it dry out for some time. If it just rains on your paper and you're trying to start a fire while you're camping, it won't work. It's no good. The leaves might be wet. You need dry. A trench was built around the altar also to help keep the water there so that all the people could see that this would be a true miracle. Here's an altar of stones with an animal on top, an ox. Twelve barrels of water had been poured on it to saturate it. Elijah then prays a very quiet prayer to God. What does God do, Joe? All right, God sends fire from heaven. Fire comes down and consumes the ox and that altar. And the people jump up, and they look around at each other in amazement, and they say, the Lord, he is God. They all jump up and shout and confess that. The difference here is the believers felt it in their hearts, probably brought tears to their eyes, were filled with emotion, and they loved it. They were thankful to their God because of what he had done and shown how powerful he is. Now the others in the crowd shouted too, the Lord, he is God. But they did it not out of faith. They did it because that's what they had just witnessed. But yet in their hearts they couldn't bring themselves to confess and say that I am on the Lord's side. I am with the Lord. Their hearts are hardened. Elijah, what did he order to have done to these 450 false Baal prophets? Garrett? Have them kill. Kill these 450 false Baal prophets. Elijah then tells Ahab, get up and leave. Get on your way, for now the Lord will send rain. It hasn't rained for three and a half years, so we know what it's like in the summer, when maybe we've gone a few weeks or even a month without rain. The next storm that comes is going to be a pretty big thunderstorm. Well, that's the same case here. So Elijah gets in his chariot and takes off, heads back for the palace. Elijah, meanwhile, what does he do? He stays here, and what does he do? Faith? He prays. He prays, he prays to God. And then every time he prays, he sends his servant out to a place, probably towards the edge of a cliff, to go look out where the sky is clear so you can see. And tell me, do you see any clouds in the sky? And six times a servant comes back and tells Elijah, no, I see nothing. But the seventh time when Elijah gets down to pray and he sends out his servant, the servant comes back with what news, Laksa? There's a cloud coming, Elijah. It's coming. There's a cloud bringing rain. Okay. Ahab is riding off to his palace and here comes rolling in this big black cloud bringing with it probably the anger of the Lord of judgment upon the people with thunder and lightning and a torrential downpour. What miracle does God have happen here? Elijah needs to get away, and he heads back for the palace, back for Samaria, and Ahab's already on his way in his cart. What does God do here? I'm going to read the end of chapter 18. Take a look there. The last verse. What happens? Emma? Micah? Joel? What happens right at the end? The last verse there in chapter 18. Jesse? Moses ran faster than Not Moses. Elijah. Elijah. How's that possible? What miracle just happened, Grant? God moved Elijah from one place to another. We can't understand what that's like. Was it as though he was riding on a cloud? We would all like to think in our mind he just moved through the air and went right past Ahab, waving to him as he went past, saying, see what the Lord can do? We don't know. Did he just disappear in one place and appear in another? But whatever happened, Elijah arrived before Ahab, even though Ahab had left before him. Okay. They're caught in that storm, but Elijah arrives first. Now, they're back at the palace. Ahab is back home with his evil wife Jezebel, and their true selves come back. They 
now they've got their reign, do you think they care about God anymore, keeping him happy? Do you think they care about Elijah? Not a one bit. Jezebel is furious with her husband Ahab when she finds out that all the Baal prophets have been slain. How can you allow Elijah to have done that? We must punish him. You can imagine a fit of rage she's in in the palace, throwing things and having a temper tantrum like a little child. And so Ahab must appease her and make her happy. And she scared him here with the message, and Elijah had to run. Elijah has to get away and get out of there because now his life is in danger. He's done what he needed to do. Now we know God will protect him, but he mustn't tempt fate, tempt God. Instead, he runs for his life and gets out of there. And he finds a place again to hide. And while he's hiding, he begins to feel sorry for himself. God sends angels to bring him food and water each day, just as he had brought sent ravens before. But angels bring him food and water for his journey. And in a cave at Mount Horeb, an angel, God sends an angel, and the angel asks him, Elijah, why don't you preach anymore? Why aren't you out teaching the people as you're supposed to do as a prophet, as a leader? Elijah acts in a bit like Moses here. He says, well, I want to quit, Lord. There's no one on your side. Listen to these murmuring people. Listen to these complainers. Look at their wickedness. Look at how they serve idols. I want to be done. I quit. Well, God needs to teach Elijah a little lesson. Elijah, you aren't the only one who's left. And God sends earthquakes. And he sends fire, Elijah. See? I can control all these things. The winds, too, blow. And that's one way God says I can teach people. I can send fire, and I can send earthquakes, and I can send wind. But sometimes, Elijah, and then God whispers in a quiet voice to Elijah, sometimes I do things in hidden ways, in unseen ways, in quiet ways. Sometimes that's how I work, Elijah. And Elijah had to understand that God wasn't always going to, just like in our lives, we might think that too, why won't God punish somebody? Why won't my, you know, if God would only send fire from heaven to burn up that person, then the rest of them would believe, then the rest would trust her. I know, I, I don't like it when I'm mocked or made fun of. If God would only send a bear like he did with Elisha and they'd come in and, and eat up that person who was mocking me, then others would know they shouldn't do that. Sometimes that's what we look for too. But Elijah had to learn, sometimes God works in quiet ways, unseen ways. And he will teach them. Okay, so you've got two questions here at the end. Do we often face the question, that means do we often ask ourselves, whom do I serve? Do we ask ourselves that? Who do I serve? Why should I ask this question of myself? Why every day or every week should I ask myself that question? Why will that be helpful to me as a Christian to do so? What do you think? Faith? Why might it be helpful to me as a Christian to ask, who is my God? Who do I serve? Katie? Take a while, I guess. Sorry. Okay, we're a little confused here. So let's 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 go a different route and see if we can get to the answer we're looking for. What are idols people make here today? What are idols that people make that we might make in our lives, Jesse? Money. What's that? Money. Okay, money. Sports players. Sports players. Other things that people make into idols, self-made idols. Faith. Okay, maybe certain activities, we always got to go do something. Technologies. Technologies. Jesse? Toys. Toys. Television, music, books, sports, anything that we, we become so focused on that we don't set any time aside for God. So we need to ask, that's what this question is here. 
Why should we ask this? Because we need to make sure, boy, I had an opportunity to go to Bible study this week, but I didn't. Instead, I went to, I don't know, I was at a basketball game five nights this week, and I skipped Bible study just to go. That's what we should ask ourselves. Have I made this a God in my life? Hey, or, boy, I stayed home. I didn't feel like doing anything. I just watched TV every night this week. Sat on the couch. We need to ask ourselves regularly, am I making a God out of something? Am I skipping godly activities that are beneficial to me? Or am I ignoring God and, and putting aside my personal devotion so that instead I can do this? So that's a, a question we should ask ourselves. Now, the second one has to do with all the people, of course, jumping up and, and saying the Lord, He is God. How is believing in God not just a matter of your mind, but in your heart? Courtney? All right. Anybody. You can go over the whole face of the earth and every single person could say, I love God. I'm a Christian. But that's with their mind. They think in their mind, well, I'm a Christian. But if they believe it in their heart, they will bear fruit. We will be able to see by the fruit that you bear. You are a Christian. Are you kind? Are you loving? Do you give of the godly finances you've been given to God's kingdom? Do you commune with Him? Do you spend time with Him? Do you visit His house regularly each Sabbath day? The fruit that you bear will show what's in your heart. So even though any man on the face of this earth can say, I'm a Christian and I love God, very few can say, I don't even need to say it. It's in my heart. You should be able to examine my life and you should know whether I love the Lord or not. And in that way, uh, we see that that's true. So that's one way that this could have been tested. All right. So you can save that, you can set that aside.